What's up, guys? Nathan here with MoveMed. I am uh, joined by Coop from Rewire HP in Los Angeles. Uh, we are going to talk a couple of things neuro-related, a couple of things related to our own respective uh, processes. I'm going to stop saying uh, and I'll let Coop talk for a little bit. Pressure's on. Now I can't say it. Uh, yeah, man, appreciate you having me on. Uh, you and I, uh, there's one, uh, you and I had connected a while back and had done some work together. I got to experience what you do with people, which I was a, a big fan of. And uh, I think this discussion can be pretty useful for athletes who want to know a little bit more about their sensory mechanics and nervous system. And, you know, what we mean when we talk about your inputs or how you perceive your environment or the world is just as important as a lot of the output based training, like how much force I can produce, how much, uh, you know, velocity I can express. And those things are obviously interrelated, but, but I think classically when we're training, we think about the latter and not enough about the former. So, uh, at any rate, yeah, I, I would say that if people haven't heard of me before I do integrative health meets sport performance and rehab is kind of a simple way to put it. And, uh, yeah, I run rewire health and performance here in the LA area and online. Right. I should have gone the way of saying I do things as well, and I am a professional. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, I had swallowed an ice cube or something. Um, I'm more specified in uh, helping people allocate uh, what degrees at which they're stressed, and then managing that stress respective. Uh, this is the tone that we're not wanting to be in. This is the tone we're going to be in. Uh, this is the frenetic state we're experiencing right now. This is how we reduce it. <clears throat> More often than not, people don't have a language for what I put them through, but they respond well to it. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it, right? Uh, sometimes we're not able to articulate, or especially the client who's totally uninitiated, it's not necessarily able to articulate how something's working or what it's doing. But very often, uh, I, as I imagine you would, I'll, I'll get feedback from clients like, whoa, like I just feel different out there. I'm moving better. I'm, I'm getting lower. I'm, I'm, I'm more reactive. It's like I can process quicker. Uh, and then other traditional things like jumping higher, I'm stronger, whatever the case may be, you know, that felt sensory experience. Yeah. I had an exciting, I mean, there's an, more often than not now, uh, I'll receive something from a client daily or several things. And I remember when that wasn't the case and I was having more difficulty explaining the process, but uh, I'm definitely not taking that for granted right now. That's a cool notion to be able to, in my own mind, recollect, okay, this person's finding this value, this person's finding this value, where before, because it was so difficult to choreograph for people, finding the language, I would condition it based off their understanding prior. And now that I'm in the position I'm in, I don't really do much benefit to people if I'm asking them what they understand before I tell them. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I think that's important, too, is like we're going to try to use as common language as possible today when we're talking. Uh, sometimes I think that we just get lost on social media trying to act like we're talking to other practitioners and coaches, but like nine out of 10 people listening, it's just an everyday athlete or individual and they don't have all that that same background and stuff. So obviously some coaches might have tactile questions, but we can always elaborate on that in comments or follow-ups or whatever. Totally. One thing I've had an issue with, and I'm not sure if you have the same because I know you're predominantly, uh, or at least it seems predominantly athlete oriented. And I, I still work with a number of people who are coaches or um, not themselves athletes, but practitioners of some system. Um, <clears throat> the notion of trying to educate someone who isn't inherently an athlete versus an athlete, you'll notice that there's a difference in dialogue with their system. Like an athlete will more soon jump into the exercise kind of being confident, even if it's unfamiliar, there's a degree of like, I'm going to try it, I'm going to find out what it does. But someone who is not necessarily an athlete or doesn't have those practice routines or mechanisms will often uh, convolute it with a lot of how do I do this? What needs to happen? There's like a process or an orientation of assessment without physically involving themselves. Have you noticed that? Have you experienced that? Yeah, definitely. And I think it, maybe even just with like younger people or more active people in general, they, they, they have more sensory familiarity, I think, in their body. Um, and thus, you know, their nervous system feels safe doing dynamic things or new things. Whereas people who don't really do that. Or if they do, it's very like hyper specified. Um, they don't have a lot of variability or not, not a very wide, um, 
movement portfolio or, or very wide scope of movement literacy, people like that tend to, or athletes like that tend to uh, really like get ultra slow and frozen up when you're like leading them through new drills. And so it's interesting in that way, it's almost like an assessment unto itself, like how, you know, how ready is this person's sensory system uh, to be able to respond to new input, right? And, and there's a number of ways you could go with that. Are they just stressed and this is what's showing up for them today? Um, and, or is this just how they are kind of perpetually, right? And I think sometimes it takes maybe multiple times of seeing someone to be able to deduce all that, you know? That's a, the way you notice the, is it today or is it a generality? Uh, I think that there are a number of systems that because they operate based off conditioning that people have to earn their way into that aren't inherently natural. There's a degree of paying less attention to someone's present state, more paying attention to how they can transition into what they're trying to appeal to. And that is to say, like, I don't care how you feel right now. I care how easily accessible or how well you can manage getting into the place I want you. Right. And like, respective of that, most people don't have a dialogue or an ability to communicate to themselves or their their coach. I feel like this. I find that this is the difficulty. What well, they'll orient around alternatively is the extrinsic factor. Like, I'm having trouble being able to do this part at this stage. I'm having trouble organizing myself at this point, at this interval. And when you consider that, people are orientating or creating a perception of self conditional on the exercise and not relative how their like resting state is which is to say you're a bat you're in a cave you scream or whatever and your ability to echolocate is relative your ability to feel the vibration coming back most people because they're in a practiced framework or like i have to make this the way i do it the tension or the the holding patterns they have are places that it doesn't necessarily echo. And so there's like a lacking degree of self-perception because people are trying to perceive themselves in a fixed pattern before they perceive themselves as, Hey, this is what I'm feeling. Yeah. That's an interesting way to put it. I think I'm trying to find like a, a back of the back of the book way to describe that for people. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, sensory awareness is not exactly right to capture all that but uh, yeah i get what you're saying i think a lot of times people have uh i don't know if it's like a set perception but sometimes it's just sort of like what shows up for them automatically when they move whether it's running walking standing whatever and then how can we maybe expand that when needed or, or correct it when needed is probably a good way to good way to talk about that for someone who's kind of uninitiated to the language if people have a fixture on how they present or rather they optimize their behavior based off of this visualization of self, it almost perpetuates um, a non-interaction or a non-participation with the world. And so that like mask wearing, I think this is like one of the worst, absolute worst behaviors someone can have. And that is faking it till you make it <laughs> a generality. If you have a uh, lacking delivery, if you can't participate authentically in something, it means that there's a deficit, whether it be you have difficulty coming to terms with how you feel about the thing, or there's some, uh, there's some reaction you're having that's not quite clear. Uh, at the end of the day, if you're having difficulty presenting authentically, there's a degree of relationship that needs to be created or developed in the environment. And for most of us, the faking it till we make it crowd, instead of us trying to develop that relationship, we optimize our uh, our understanding of how we can make it work without doing that. So it's almost like the world is at fault because we never change. And if. Yeah, I, interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it like that. Yeah, you know, I had um, at one point I had a like a counselor that I was going to and uh, kind of a communication expert. And he, he was really big on neuro-linguistic uh, programming, right. Or NLP. And one of the things that he had, he had taught me was, you know, anytime someone lies, whether it's big or just sort of like a little self-preserving white lie that they do in the moment without realizing it, especially those automatic ones. Like I, I can't hang out with you this weekend. I got to go do this. And it's, they just, that it's the same sort of fear of survival that kicks in for that. And so that's a self-preserving mechanism or reflex there. And, 
you know, so there is some level of like sensory, like threat detection there. It could be kind of like consciously driven by like logical information that's being inputted. It also, I think, could just be from, from your environment. Although in your context, it's probably a little more conscious and thought out. And then that manifests as subconscious and, and vice versa too, right? Um, but that being said, yeah, I do think that the word he would use too, uh, when he would talk to me about it is being dissociated as well, right? If you're, if you don't have, you know, if, if you're kind of always up in your head in a left brain capacity, you probably don't have, you know, you're, you're an overthinker, you're anxious, or you usually you're in like a kind of like a state of perpetual worry, right? And if you don't have access to your body, right, that's usually indicative of having poor, now transitioning to the tactile side, poor sensory awareness of your body. You're not as kinesthetic. You're not able to like feel your body as much. Um, and I think that the people who tend to be more authentic and genuine and feel just comfortable presenting as, as themselves are more what the kind of woo woo crowd would call grounded. And I think grounded also isn't just like a, how mature you are, you know, that like, it's not like just a tangible thing. It's also like a felt sensory thing too. Right. You know, I feel grounded, even if there's like a loud noise, right. That's more, we're getting more physiological or biological at that point. And it's kind of the same thing. I'm interacting with someone who's asking me uncomfortable questions or like, you know, kind of whatever it, it's making me uncomfortable one way or another, being able to stay grounded as yourself in that, I think is a, is, is, is a physical thing and a, you know, a mental emotional thing too. Right. I agree with you. Yeah. Everything has meaning to us. Uh, I, I get this um, fixation when I talk to people who are trying to develop themselves and they come to terms with, uh, and then when I'm dealing with this, I have trouble putting myself first or whatever, or I, I have trouble communicating this when someone's, in this framework, <clears throat> um, I think this notion of being selfless is uh, like constructing yourself around this imagery of being selfless is this orientation of presiding over your life from the perspective of the community as opposed to yourself. Right. And how, I'm, how I mean that is like, you can be a part of the community without having to be separate from the community in that respect. Um, and the better that you create your own relationship with self, the more you're going to have a tangible construct to like relate to other relationships. Yeah. But until such time as you have that, like you can look yourself in the eyes in a mirror and not feel a plethora of shame or whatever. There's a degree of everyone's going to see how you feel about yourself via mirror relationships or mirror neurons. Like you, yeah. you can't falsify what people know about their own brains. And so right. when you see that relationship, if you're walking around with your fist tight as fuck, people aren't going to be like, hmm, that guy's probably a boxer. <laughs> or that guy's relaxed, you know, even, even simpler than that. Yeah, yeah, it is funny how these things show up in the body. Um, there's a lot of books that have been written on it, some of which people might have heard of, like The Body Keeps the Score and, and the biological uh, representations or, or, or downstream consequences from stress and trauma and just life load or what they call allostatic load there's other things too like actually right here so i can have books behind me so it appears like i maybe know what i'm doing <laughs> or smart whatever uh the molecules of emotion by dr candace pert that's a that's a good one too just if people are interested in digging into the biological side of stress and emotion and things like that and the relationship between the two it just suggests everything's energetic and there's a when people say vibe or vibration what they're really describing is the energy frequency of whatever the the living organism or non-living thing is like if we're in an emotional state that's happy our vibration is going to be more uh frequent and regular than if we were in a state of anxiety or depression and we'll start to feel that pinging effect it'll feel more rhythmic and it'll feel jarring yeah yeah certainly um yeah, I would agree with all that. I think that, you know, the people don't necessarily realize, but the government has been interested in studying this stuff for a while. Um, we don't necessarily, we can't measure all the ways in which we, we pick up on some of these other things. But, you know, I think that obviously some of it is woo woo, but a lot of them are tangible things, even if we can't necessarily explain the science yet, right? It's sort of like, how did people explain electricity before they understood it, you know? So it doesn't mean it wasn't there, just didn't understand it yet. I still don't understand it. 
<laughs> yeah, they, most people, if they're being honest, don't, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to pretend it. I can screw in a light bulb. <laughs> yeah, well, you're ahead of most Gen Z then. <laughs> Just no, no manual labor skills. That's right. I've had some manual labor jobs, so that, that helps to that effect. So we, uh, we also, we kind of got a little bit in the weeds there of like mind body and the relationship between the two and some of the inner workings under the hood. Uh, what would you say to athletes who might not have ever considered their sensory mechanics or how their sense various sensory systems take in the world, right? What, what would you say, what, like, what's some value that could be had by understanding that and then uh, you know, what would you reckon, where would you recommend people start with that? I think that any athlete on the planet earth can probably agree with the notion that when they step onto whatever field is their, their sport, if it's a court, if it's a grass field, if it's whatever, uh, they're finding themselves in their most <clears throat> alert yet, um, uh, playful state that they exist in which is to say like their body feels the most meaning that it usually feels and probably arguably uh will feel when it's actively playing that sport so there's a mixture between uh there's a lot on the line and then there's a mixture between i feel very alive and if people orient around the sensations that those are all sensations they're not <clears throat> mental imagery i mean even though you're cognizant of what you're the scope of everything the reason why there's meaning behind that is because your heart is beating because the amount of volume in your body is increased there's a degree of input intensity that corresponds with the effort of the environment and the people who are really athletic or the people who are really capable of maintaining a presence in an environment are those who can manage their own frequency or vibe respective of uh, an impact like a, a heavy encroaching energy or a frequency around them which is to say if you're doing your thing like your sport and there's a thousand people watching or ten thousand people watching are you still able to pay attention to how you feel less so are you swayed by the environment and, and that would be like classical like shrinking people who shrink in the moment right you know that regardless of how well they do in practice and i think maybe some of the best players are going to be, you know, they always say the difference is confidence, right? It's like, how can you, you know, people who maybe feel most relaxed in that situation too, right? This is my home environment. I've played this sport my whole life too. And I'm also okay with the pressure, right? That's a lot. And then, you know, familiarity of like motor patterns too. I've done this a million times. Of course, I don't mind, you know, taking a shot late in the fourth quarter, right? You know, the game on the line. So um, I think there's a lot that goes into it, but yeah, I, I agree with all that. I think the majority of those conversations or the way that people can, uh, when you just gave example of what would be going through someone's head, those were all examples of the answer is already there. You're just describing what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. So that's to say language comes after sensation in respect of how our brain is developed. Like the limbic system has no words, but it has behaviors, has feeling, has memories. And in that respect, the only thing that we have to get good at is not being able to differentiate between limbic and neocortex, but to be able to uh, essentially detail or describe what is experienced without trying to articulate what we want versus what we're actually experiencing. So for most of us, <clears throat> when we describe the inputs that we're experiencing, it interbulates us. But because we don't have a body that can present with that interpolation, we don't have enough receptors built out. We don't have enough tissue to capacitate that amount of intensity. We usually experience ourselves locking up as a byproduct of my body isn't this sensitive. So it's not going to respond well to this amount of sensation. And sensation could be something as a byproduct of their sound in my environment, or it could be I am in an environment that's familiar, it's reminding me of how loud that room environment is. And because of the trauma coinc like, uh, coincidentally happening, I'm thinking that this environment is much more intense than it is. Right. At Sorry, but my last thing is just athletes don't do that. They're not paying attention to the environment as the thing telling them how it is. They're paying attention to how their body is keeping pace with that rhythm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think you said something important early on, which is 
a lot of times people are already talking about this stuff. They're just doing it in common everyday language. We're just sort of talking about aspects of what's going on under the hood and, 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 and speaking to that. Um, I think also a lot of times, especially in this generation, right. With, uh, you know, people who are, I would say more dissociated from ever, thanks to technology, a lot of times the reason they might feel uncomfortable or maybe more uncomfortable than they ought to in those moments, right. In game or late game, just high pressure situations is because they're more, as we talked about earlier, they're more dissociated from their body. So they might not have a great relationship of feeling that felt uh, physical presence or, or, or sensory familiarity with their body. So when uh, like something in their environment makes them feel all that, they're like, whoa, and maybe they haven't, they don't really feel that on a regular basis unless it's like a big time stimuli like that. So they associate that with, with some level of fear, right? If you look at trauma too, there, there's, like high level, like, like we'll talk like war veteran PTSD level trauma. Um, a lot of times they've like the brain because it, it, it fears that associate, it, it associates that sensation with the thing itself that whatever the triggering event was, the brain will literally cauterize access to being able to feel certain parts of the body, not necessarily like a whole physical part, but like certain nerves within that. Um, and then when those get reactivated by, by another event, whether it's the same or different, the brain might feel those things that it's, it, it really kind of like, you'll see people shut down and it's, it's, totally. it's funny because it's the same or, or very similar mechanisms of action to like an athlete being in the game as it is to like the dude who gets nervous at the bar talking to the girl, right? It's like the same kinds of, the same kinds of things at play there. Right. Um, and, and all that just to say, I think it's more present in this day and age because of our modern environment, people are more dissociated, they're more kind of head doing heady things technologically, right? And and we've we, we our, our current environment doesn't necessarily nurture being physically present in your body, starting from childhood when it's perhaps most important to develop those neurological adaptations from playing a lot, being outside more, um, you know, things things like that. You know, you hear PE classes getting canceled and not having funded, all kinds of stuff like that. I think it all feeds into the same the same end game, right? Even if there's more than one input driving us there. Yeah, the way I've seen it for myself is uh, just thinking about that while you're talking. Um, I think that injury presides over athleticism or athletic potential. The more that someone gets injured and gets back up, so to speak. And that's to say, um, if we think about coddled behavior, mirror behavior, if someone tries to take you out of your experience and tells you how to feel during it. So I'll use the example of like overly protective or overly supportive parents. A kid falls down, the parent goes over and it's crying for the baby. The baby starts crying. Now imagine if that baby, you didn't have the kid, the, the parent around and it looked around and it didn't have the ability to cry towards someone to make them like handle it or foster some, some return to normalcy. That baby has to figure out <clears throat> what's going on and giving the opportunity for someone to experience themselves and then have the natural reaction to themselves to self-assess. It's a degree of self-awareness that most people have not trained into their, their brains. So it's like they wake up every morning with this lack of potentiality to see themselves because they never mirrored behavior. They had their behavior uh, instructed. And as a byproduct, they're not necessarily a normal person. They're a person fact, they're like fostered by ideals, but not presented value. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen a lot of different uh, examples of some of that stuff. Like when, you know, kids maybe don't have the emotional equipment to process something and they don't necessarily have someone to guide them through it or their experience maybe like you said on the other extreme gets overly managed by a parent, especially like maybe not one time, but when this is kind of a repeat thing mm -hmm. that could manifest as different things when they're an adult, right? Totally. I also think now one thing we talked, so a lot of what we talked about today is just general adaptability of the organism. Maybe we're talking about it more with respect of the nervous system and, and, and whatnot, but yeah, general, I think adaptability, whether it's being comfortable in new movement patterns, like we were talking about earlier with, with athletes or people that you're showing new positions or new patterns to, and they kind of hurt like the differences and how they react to that. Um, I also think there's a physiological component too, right? So I, 
one of my things is I, I really believe that the modern environment leaves us as human beings as like a fish outside the fish tank, only instead of dying without being in the water like a fish in, you know, minutes, you're, it's like a slow burn degeneration over time. And, and a lot of the modern environment, we talked about technology earlier, is, is maladaptive, right? From not getting the right light inputs to dietary inputs, uh, things like that. Like you know, we talked about neurological inputs and then that can manifest as stress in the body. If someone's, if someone's eating some, these things don't exist in silos, right? If something is, someone is doing something that's uh, promoting a high level of chronic inflammation on a regular basis, that's also going to be perceived as a threat by the nervous system too, right? And then that can impact how someone activates their tissues, their muscles, right? How, how they fire and wire their muscles. It can activate, you know, or it can, it, it can actually constrain a movement portfolio because, you know, one of these or more of these sensory systems doesn't necessarily feel comfortable because there's already some level of stress input there. So I think that a lot of times, uh, people might bark up one tree or the other if, if, if they even do it all. And, and, and really, we should be talking about the interrelation of, or the holistic nature of these things and how when you see someone day in and day out or when you see an athlete on the court, that, that ultimately, it's like a math equation. It's the summary of all these inputs, good, quote unquote, yeah. bad, quote unquote, and, okay. uh, and where they're at. And in order to kind of reverse engineer that, we, we should be barking up these relevant trees, right? The, uh, sensory mechanics, light, sleep, like all that kind of stuff, right? You know, per current life stressors, you know, or allostatic load, right? All that kind of stuff. One of the things that I find uh, coming up for me with that, uh, a lot of athletes don't have developed personalities outside of their athleticism. So because they've defined that their value or their importance comes when they're being acknowledged, and this is the same for most of us, we define ourselves around where we are acknowledged or seen as valuable as opposed to where we find our own intrinsic value. Just takes more work to do that, I guess. Um, even athletes <clears throat> have this degree of justified stress state, and it's probably more justified with athletes that they're farther on the sympathetic but because they have so much input tolerance that uh, the only time that they ever experience some relief from their sympathetics is when they're experiencing themselves in fluidity, because every other time is, is not a, a relief of tension. It's not a relief of uh, uh, confusion and neural processing. It's always compounding their control and control is that like deciding factor for most of us. Um the one thing that our body does outside of our control is it operates and reacts reflexively. So for example, if you're tripping, you're probably not going to consciously stop yourself from falling. Your body will do it inherently. And for those of us that don't have that ability, I would equate it to the lack of variability in their eyes, not so much in the muscles competency, but the dialogue with which there's potential for things moving around the eyes. Because when there's stuff moving around the eyes, there's this there's this greater potentiality of if I move my head here, I might get hit or I might get uh, impeded or I might not see what's going on clearly anymore. Um, dodgeball was what brought that to mind. Um, <clears throat> like one of the easiest ways for you to be like non-threatened, but also feel the increase of threat tolerance is to know that your eyes can track more information without you being affected by that information. Um, which is why when you're driving, for example, it's like one of the most stressful things a human being can experience because there's not a visual and vestibular analog with motion. It's only visual. So people don't understand why it is their body's moving as fast as it is or why images are passing the eyes as quickly as they are. Um, so which is to say most people, no matter what state they're in, have no clarity on how their nervous system affects them when they're not doing the thing they want to do. So that is to say, building a base neutral, building a, a foundation that other people can see and you can feel confident in is going to be everyone's biggest or most beneficial practice. And confidence is not something that you have to earn through convincing yourself. It's not that. Confidence is something that is a dialogue between brain talking to body, body talking to brain, and the two of them being able to do it without you interfering. So you don't have to mind the business of your autonomic systems. And if we get into a good body brain relationship, we're going to be in the position of when we 
want to do something, our body's going to do it a little more graciously without having to be jerky and forceful. And the more we live in a body like that, people are going to register, oh, this person is fluid in their intentions. I don't feel a mask from this person. I don't feel like he's rushed or forced or whatever. And when you can dialogue the world like that, and you can see the amount of acceptance uh, that you receive as a byproduct of people liking your behavior. It doesn't have to be because you agree on points. It's because you're just confident in your own behavior. Then you get to see that the whole world confidence is literally just permission. Confidence is how much can your nervous system be permissible around an environment that's threatening? Can you still justify behaving the way that's comfortable to you, despite being in an environment that could potentially be uncomfortable? Yeah, definitely. And I think some of the stuff we talked had talked about earlier was a lot of times like athletes or whomever, uh, you know, they, they feel comfortable in their own wheelhouse in their own small town in their own sport. And then when you, you know, whether it's introducing an athlete, like having one of my hoopers go play tennis or one of my football guys go play tennis and something totally new, <laughs> like thinking through the movements and they don't feel comfortable. Um, you know, that that's, it's very similar to like what you're saying now, just, you know, being able to be around a, a new environment because you move, right. Or, or because you're, you know, you're around people who might not necessarily gravitate towards you or might kind of like other you subconsciously, right. It's like, it's all, it's all kind of the same stuff at some level. Right. Okay. And so I think if sometimes we can create those conditions by being in a, in an environment regularly or doing the same movement pattern regularly or whatever it is, other times it's like the more we can develop a robust sensory system that that is okay with variability um, the the better adaptable we can be and then also then in turn how do we support that through nur like a, a nurturing supportive environment adaptive nutrition right that you know like like making your sleep more um, restorative right all those kinds of things and then uh yeah, I think you just find that as, as an organism generally as you become more energetic you become more adaptive you become more fluid and flexible and uh less like rigid and, and calcified right, right. Like, like someone like danny roddy would say so true so what is uh when you now we've talked a lot about uh background and what's going on under the hood when you're working with someone let's say on the vision side of things like what what are some things that you do with them what 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 are some of your sessions look like in that regard? Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna pre I'm gonna preface this with a little background. Um, if you look in, you can see that my head is wider up until my temples, mm -hmm. and then when I try to raise, you can see the wrinkles set in, but that's like the height of my forehead. I can get it up there. It should be a little bit of activity that I don't want to like go into right now. The idea is I hit my head when I was younger, reduced development around here because I started to compensate and opening my mouth from here as opposed to closing it from here. So the muscles that are designed to like open the jaw down here, we're not doing it. And in the way that <clears throat> our eyes relate to the body, it's almost like the dynamics of how our eyes can perceive light is relative how we can feel ourselves moving around uh, the lenses. And if we don't receive light in certain dynamics, we're not moving around that part of the lens, so to speak. And what I re realized for me, I grew up with a ton of headaches and I only realized that there are migraines in the last couple of years. Like I had no understanding of how bad my my sensory system was just like how overloaded it was because no one could put words to it for me um i help people to uh, uh by the ability to create buoyancy or balance the idea of like a resting um uh, uh floating state because the face is usually the point of tension that people orient around because there's emotion there so that's to say, if I'm creating focus at something, I'm oftentimes going to create focus from my face. I'm not going to like, like tension into my shoulder. I'm going to feel like the emotions of my face relative to the environment. I'm going to tension around that emotion. And then my whole body is going to construct around the emotional presentation I may or may not display on my face. 
And that could be, uh, even if I'm not displaying it, it's going to affect the way that my nostrils inflate, my throat inflates. It's going to affect the way that I feel myself being motile in my body, just as a byproduct of if I feel threatened, I'm going to tighten. If I feel excited, I'll probably smile a little bit on the inside. I try to get people to feel the orientation of what a smile or what uh, you think a hot air balloon when the hot air fires upward. What does that buoyant feeling feel like to be able to bring ourselves into uh, extension of the head? Because for most of us, the sinus is underloaded. It's not very pumped. So this area wouldn't be super saturated for most people. And that's to say when they breathe inward, instead of breathing upward toward their eyes, they breathe backward along their tongue. And you'll see it like uh, thick tongues, you'll see fat face, some degree of like lack of orientation, like they can't rotate super well because the thing that they would help rotate around is not rotating or, or shifting. Uh, so I get people to feel what it's like to take the weight out of their face and start to feel the buoyancy of their airway and reflexively. It's like uh, in the same way after you've thrown up, where you coughed, you feel yourself being a little more robust in your torso, you feel yourself being a little hot, maybe a little bit, even though you're uncomfortable, there's a degree of like, fullness to a person after they've purged out of their throat. Some level of physical presence is kind of what he's saying, like you feel this area, right? Oh, totally, totally. That's just a byproduct of how much activity ingratiates from that vagus channel, the neck being supportive, the neck being like, passively supportive translates to so much in the body because there's not a lot of structure around here which allows for there being a lot of constriction but if it's supported if the airway is supportive then all of this structure that likes to tension that likes to bring our body into a more alert state doesn't do that and now i get to pay attention to how i'm moving around my trunk and my body the larger part of my my orientation right I don't try to focus on the visual as much as I focus on the reduction of visual tensions so that people can start to ob uh, objectively feel themselves more present without being present to the things they're usually focused on. Because I can guarantee you as soon as this happens, they start they stop remembering what things were consciously discomforting and they fall into that sensory state where the sensation is reminding them, oh, we're good. We're good. We can actually go farther into whatever's going on. Right, This new thing that's going on right now, we can do more of it. Right, right. So it's interesting about you saying that. And I just want to qualify a couple of things for people listening who might not understand the language is yeah. when he talks about certain behaviors or certain qualities being reflexive, like posture or, or, or things like that, that just means automatic, right? Like a lot of times you'll hear bullshit regurgitated. That's our second shit, by the way. Oh, that's our third. Uh, so you'll hear people say, oh, pull your shoulders back manually, right? And so uh, there's a quote that I love that says your posture's not, you're not supposed to hold your posture. Your posture is supposed to hold you, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just a, a simple way of saying it's supposed to be automatic and reflexive. Uh, Matt Boulay of Posturology, a lot of like what he talks about is very similar and it's supposed to be automatic. So that's a lot of what I, I'll do with people too who have like, you know, whether it's like a movement deficiency or a postural issue is we're doing things where it's like automatic uh, and, and not something someone has to manually cue, right? In fact, pulling your shoulders back manually is one of the worst things you can do as far as like postural adjustments. Um, there's even research showing that it creates thoracic outlet syndrome or, yeah. you know, diagnosis by elimination kind of pain syndromes. And a lot of my listeners will know about that because of what happened with Mark L. Fultz and his sort of like phantom shoulder pain, right? It got diagnosed as thoracic outlet syndrome, but all that just to say you want your posture uh, and, and breathing really, and a lot of this stuff to be automatic, right? So for myself personally, a lot of people I work with, I get instantaneous feedback. If I do something goofy, if I'm doing like, totally. you know, I'm not saying, saying I can't put myself in those positions. Like I need, if I need to bend over and look at my phone here and there, that's not bad. Every posture serves a purpose, but if I'm here in excess, it's almost like you feel a little puppet string saying, Hey dude, you're, you're not doing the right thing, you know, in your sensory systems, right? It's like, oh, okay. And then I'm pulling myself naturally that way. And I think there's also a structural component too. If you have the right um, muscles, some of which you do and don't see in the mirror built up, right? Um, you know, a lot of times you'll talk about the vasovagal response too, or just having circulation and thus innervation or, or activation of tissues in different areas, whether it's fascia or muscle, 
those things kind of just hold you in, in, in place naturally, right? So when I, when I go for walks, like I'm feeling an abdominal stretch and activation. I'm feeling my, you know, my back chain from my neck all the way down to my, my calves if I tune in, right? So mm-hmm. I think getting people more sensory awareness in the body in general is good. And then I think as you build up some of these more reflexive behaviors, it's like those things combine just to give people better feedback about their place and their environment. It also helps you just feel more grounded, right? Whether that's from like a sturdy movement perspective, or like we talked about earlier, like a mental, emotional, social perspective, you know? One of the um, biggest four players are like the uh, progenitors of this kind of environment where like posture and behavior are intercorrelated with feeling. Um, Wim Hof, he does a lot toward that. Uh, he does a lot toward the effect of bringing something into a, uh, I guess, a more active sympathetic state that kind of, as it tailors out of like an energy supply, becomes more parasympathetic. So it's like, we like the experience of going into that high end. Now we're going to rest into our, we can't go high anymore. Um, people get fixated on trying to create a dialogue is by like it's a drug like you do the thing you get the result yoga breath work whatever 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 and when you said the structure we don't have the muscle we don't have that like we don't have that presiding relationship we're looking at uh you can actually just see it right here this chart right here this is a dead body it's not a living body showing how a living body would stand or orient and that's to say we orient posture from these relationships. We see uh, the science is around um, uh, dead bodies. So it's not like you saw someone in motion. You saw how that posture was supposed to analog. Majority of the drawing back the shoulder blades is a relationship of what you see here. But in a living body, these bones are doctored by the sacs of air that fill up inside of them. And that's to say the bones don't shift, but the relationships to the bones do. And Wim Hof's study is, uh, or one of the studies that Wim Hof talks on, or one of them that justifies his process is the intercostals or the the, uh, heat bearing muscles that go between the ribs start to generate a heat supply. And his like big belly breathing gets those muscles to be a little bit more inflated by the end of it. But if you're good at creating intrinsic pressure, which most athletes are, you're going to start to find that the rib cage doesn't just expand forward with the lungs. It expands here. It expands backward. Oh, yeah. But if we spent a lot of time in this forward position, we can't even get it to expand fully backward until we've gotten ourselves stacked again or relative. We're pulling from a neutral. And for most of us, we're so far gone from our neutral that we don't know what it's like to gravitate relative our structure. We know how to gravitate relative our control patterns. So if anyone wants to know like a really quick way to develop uh, balance in the system as well as uh, an immunity tolerance, because the uh, Wim Hof study is around his sickness preventative measures, put a belt around your chest like a dress belt, tie it. Uh, and do your best to close the belt with your muscles. So you're trying to tighten both sides. And then if you can breathe your lungs bigger, you're going to find that the lungs do most of the job of moving the rib cage to create that shoulders down and back. I've been working on trying to get my, my thoracic spine to, to remedy. And I've been doing a lot more recently, but one of the things that's been helping the most, my sternum's here. Most of us have like a kind of bony collarbone or like end of sternum where the manubrium, the top of the tie is. And that's because this vertebrae right here is always being lifted because our traps are being lifted. And if we didn't do that, if we instead packed our traps, right? We came back over the head. Then each breath we have is going to be pushing into our clavicle, pushing into our traps, which are depressed. So the inhalation spreads the traps and as soon as the traps spread the muscle of our pec starts to fire not backward to get our short blades to squeeze but it fires the ribs over to create more of that presentation and as the chest starts to rise we get to be a little more extensive but it's not a byproduct of 
like I want to be in this position. It's an allowance of how the tissue oxygenates and then suspends itself against the other tissue. And the only way we can start to make that happen, this bone structure or the tie that runs down center, that guy gets tight as soon as our throat gets tight because our throat is connected to our diaphragm. So if most of us have a tendency to not know how we respond to tensions, then we're going to start to usually get smaller as a byproduct of fear, as a byproduct of stimulus that doesn't make sense to us. And as soon as that happens, our confidence is effective, affected. Yeah. So depreciate. Absolutely. I mean, they've, they've even done studies showing that people who put themselves in that position for minutes on end, uh, stress hormones like cortisol and stuff like that, um, you know, kick in right away. And then, as, you know, different mood associations with depression or stress also are, are reported subjectively too. Um, that's also like when you see an animal, right? Arching its back, it's the same kind of stressed out situation. Maybe, maybe not necessarily as dramatic because it's not like a true survival, but, but, you know, at a low level, the same kind of thing. I think, you know, one way to summarize that for someone listening is that, you know, breath is not just a remote control for the body in terms of helping you feel energized or relaxed, but it's also can be a structural remote control too. Right. So I love the breath. I love the, the belt, uh, you know, drill, if you want to call it that, um, another thing that, you know, you and I have done is balls under the armpits too. And it's where PRI also talks about this too, with a lot of their reaching and like posterior expansion, right. Is, is you're getting people to breathe three dimensionally. And then what's interesting is that their structure actually becomes bigger at that point too. Right. And, and like, you know, they can get their chest high without rib cage flare and they can have, when he says stack, by the way, guys, it's like a nice neutral joint stack, right. Or, or, or posture, if you will. So a lot of these things all just work together and it might sound like a lot to think about here, but you know, our, the, the drills that, you know, we have you do, it, it, it helps make this a lot simpler, right? Even if some of the underworking mechanisms are a little bit more complex. And that's why they hire us. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. But I think that, that's a super simple thing too, is like just the, everybody has a belt, right? Um, like I said, even these Gen Zers that dress down all the time, right? But just a belt around the rib cage, super simple. I like, what I like doing also is uh, I put like resistance bands kind of over like the outer part of the trap here yeah. and then down across to the opposite foot, like a suspender, put certain like balls, basically not usually, I don't usually do tennis balls. I usually do them slightly bigger, but that really will help people naturally kind of depress their traps too, instead of kind of pulling them up in this state. Yeah. Um, and then breathe three-dimensionally into their structure as well. I also think it's important for people at home uh, to know we're not saying like having big traps is bad. It's just that they sometimes can get in the way, right? Um, or, or need a little bit of management. I can make my traps like hang up really high and make them look big like someone who's flexing them like in that, that position. Yeah, exactly. They're not naturally meant to suspend your head like that. I mean, just this relationship alone, you see the, cr uh, the crease right here? Right. That's a weak vertebrae that doesn't know how to go into extension fully because I put too much weight forward into my throat for most of my life. So that's why there's some atrophy or rather not so, as much support there. But as soon as I create a little bit of tension and I can delineate that separation a little better. And now my trap is not part of my neck as much. But for most of us, we're not big enough to separate the tissue that we already have in supply on our body, which is to say we don't oxygenate well enough and we've not spent enough time stretching our body tissue out to fully oxygenate. So we spend time inflating, but we don't compress that air or compress that breath to make it something that creates more of a pressure vacuum in the body. Instead, it makes us more like ambiently motile. Right. And as a byproduct, we've experienced this degree of like uh, being okay, being moved, but not knowing how to move ourselves. So like we follow the motion, we can like include points of inflammation in the action, but we're not going to feel sensitivity there. Right. Yeah, that, that's so that's one of the more interesting things too, that I don't think people realize is like when you're doing a nice standing neutral and by that, I mean, you're just like 
standing with solid posture, you're actually meant to feel, or when you walk, you're actually meant to feel, if you, if you tune in, not super aggro or anything, but if you tune in, you're meant to feel the tissues on your neck as it kind of connects to your, your chest down here when you walk. Um, and a lot of times when you see people age and they get that turkey gobbler neck, some of that's from general, you know, degeneration of the, the, the organism, but some of it's also just because as we age, we just don't, there's, there's no like connection there. There's no like resting tensegrity or tension that actually kind of helps this stuff stay like comfortably, uh, you know, lengthened out, but also just a little bit of tension there. Right. So it's also why you see more and more people in this day and age having smaller jaws. Part of that's diet. They're not necessarily eating enough like solid, chewy things like meat, but they're also, um, like you said, they're, they're, they're losing some level of sensation. there, putting themselves in poor positions. Then you'll see muscles around the jaw and even the structure itself kind of atrophy. So I've naturally got a pretty big jaw, but since doing a lot of this work, I've noticed that my, you know, I have less tension and pain in the back of my neck for one, less pain oh. around here, but also it's just a, it's natural. And, and you get a lot of this sensation and muscular buildup, uh, that stays there, you know, yeah. and, and all, I guess just to tie it back to the beginning, it's all kind of resultant in me feeling more solid, just physically in myself too. Right. Whether that's for fitness and performance or whether that's just as a person, right. Showing up as yourself as they say. Uh, I'm running to the, the tail end of uh, how much time I've got, but one point I'd like to add to that is um, uh, when people get fixated on trying to correct themselves, uh, the idea of following a rubric is oftentimes disconnected from no matter how right you think some system is, <laughs> they will never tell you what happened to you. They will never tell you what you experienced. They'll only give you an opportunity to remedy it relative to their process. So I think it's super important for people to understand how to therapize themselves, not in the I'm going to make myself feel better, but in a way that they can talk to themselves and be listened to. So in the case of what I was talking about earlier, when you fall over, in the amount of times I've hurt myself and there's not been someone around to be like, let's make this better. Uh, I've, I've gone through the thoughts of, am I going to die? Or am I going to like all those things that we naturally go through and not the worry of it necessarily each time, but like the process of like an immature brain, having an injury and being like, what is this? How terrible is this? And when you realize that it's not as bad as the fear managed to tell you it was, and that's like 10 seconds ago, you start to gravitate towards, oh, I have way more time to react than I, than I have been taking advantage of. And for most of us, we don't have that wherewithal that laying on the ground, I'm not dying or I didn't die. I still have some time to figure out what's going on. They have that wherewithal that they can change how they feel or at least assess how they feel. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, for people who don't know any better, I like to think about uh, creating this parenting dialogue or telling someone to be a parent to themselves. In my case, a dad to myself. If I feel like I'm suffering or I feel like I'm struggling, the way in which I'll try to recover that process is I won't tell myself the matters of fact that are going on. I'll look at myself like a kid, and this is like my mind's eye, and I'll see how my little kid self is reacting to inexperience, less so reacting to something that's tangible or real. And then I'll start to uh, orient around, I don't have clarity here. This is something new. This is a new fall. And I need to learn how to get myself up. Uh, instead of focusing on how badly I fell. And in being able to dad or parent yourself, I think there becomes this relationship of selfishness that people get over the hump of judging themselves for it. When you think about and care about yourself well enough, it allows for you to create relationships outside of you. Until yeah. such time, you're probably going to be creating the same relationship that you have with yourself or the same relationship you perceive you have with the people who you're running away from, or you never really fix the traumas from parents, family, friend, whatever it may be. So any and all issues I think stem from people being too selfless or rather thinking about how other people are going to view or experience them before they first think, how do I view and experience myself? Uh, I think more people pick up on uh, a mirror relationship someone has with themselves 
than they do pick up on how they feel about you. So if you ever want someone to feel good about you, feel good about yourself to start, it'll translate to uh, controlling the whole dynamic. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. I mean, in every, that's really what they're getting at too. This is, you kind of gave a tangible definition, but that's really what they're getting at. in pretty much any personal development or spiritual practice is, you know, you have to like self-care before you can really try to like fix other things too. Right. Um, and then naturally when you have that self-love and self-care that, that in turn means you respect yourself and in, in turn from that comes other things, how you carry yourself, you know, taking care of your health and fitness, like all this, you know, performance, all this other stuff that then will translate to how other people, you know, will perceive you too. I also think, um, you know, with regards to the brain and NLP, what you just talked about there uh, and your relationship with yourself, how you self-parent is really important, right? So in NLP, they'll talk about how, we'll talk about something called parts integration. And so sometimes like big time stressors or anxieties uh, is because this one little part or part of the brain thinks it's the whole, right? Usually something that didn't get the parenting it needed at a certain time earlier in your life. And it bubbles up and tries to make a decision for the whole, yeah. thinks it is the whole, right? So when you, when you have that dialogue with yourself, what you're literally doing is being a parent to yourself. And so the, the adult inside, right. And you are kind of like telling that little part or the kid, it's, it's like, it's literally like talking to your inner child. When they say inner child, that's, that's what they're talking about. Right. Um, so that being said, it helps you better manage that. So that one little part doesn't bubble up as strongly next time and then make a big decision for the whole that might not be in the best interest of the whole, right? Like, no, you, you shouldn't quit your job and become an entrepreneur or do what you really want or move to this place because you're going to, you know, we associate that with fear and you're going to, you're going to mess up. Right. Instead, it's like, you know, you can actually feel that just sit there and be physically present with that discomfort. Like you said, have some sort of dialogue there. And then the irony in that is that by feeling that more and by allowing that, you actually make this sort of bubble back down beneath the waves. And in the future, when triggering events come up, this slowly but surely doesn't come back as strongly or as, as intensely, right? So it allows you to be the, you know, to self-author your life better. It allows you to make the decisions that you need to make without your nervous system being quicksand that kind of pulls you down and keeps you stuck in the same, the same situation. Yeah, you know who gets it, uh, gets it by way of their ability to communicate about it, because there's this degree of like a acknowledgement or a acceptance, like you accept the fact that you don't know, like it, we're talking about a subject that's not tangible, we're talking about like an orientation around how we feel about how we feel. And so it's a dialogue and experience, like we figured it out by way of feeling the feelings and then thinking about the feelings and then acting on them. So rel relative that people are going to think that the action is more consequential than the behavior being repeated in pattern. But at the end of the day, you're just trying to create a memory of safety in a time of threat. So you can start to articulate that you always carry around safety mechanisms that don't necessarily ignore the threat, but keep you present to it. Yeah. You're like a rock being, you know, grounded amidst potential wild waves or just still waves, right? And that's uh, having more choice around your experience and ability to stay present with it is another form of like the organism being adaptable and adaptive and, and not rigid or shrinking down, right? It's, it's you know, it's more organismic or, or individual adaptability to ever changing environments, right? Or whether it's life change or changing your environment athletically, right? I like that. You, you said it's like calm in the storm. Uh... You don't fight the storm, you accept the storm, and the storm washes away what it's going to wash away without you having any say whatsoever. Yeah, totally. And ironically, that's actually what, uh, you know, my old NLP coach would, would say is like, it's like a crab, right? You, you're hanging on for dear life to this, this rock when there's waves going on around you, and then it's just a lot more effortless if you just let go and allow, right? Path of least resistance type, type stuff is how they articulate it in a lot of spiritual and personal development practice, but that's, you know, I think a helpful analogy for people to it, it quite literally go with the flow, you know? Yeah. Run through the storm as buffaloes do. Yeah. Um, cool beans, dude. I got to get going because I got a session I have to work on or work with. Sounds good. Yeah. I appreciate you having me on. We'll have to do it again sometime. If Thank people want to learn more, I guess, about each of us, it's movemed.net or com? Net. 
that, and then I am rewireperformance.com or at rewire HP, the HP is for health and performance, but at rewire HP on Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok for the time being. So we'll see. Sweet, man. It was a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Uh, thanks, brother. Appreciate you.